So my name is Tama Onakahara. I'm head of the developer experience team at a company called Weaveworks. Uh, this is part of what's called the Weave Online User Group. It's been a weekly series that uh, we have Stacy here, our community manager, has been putting together. She's got an exciting calendar through this year, and then we're getting ready for the next year. If this is your first time, then welcome. Thanks for joining our Weave Online User Group. We have a variety of talks every week from, um, by our own uh, members, our engineers, or people of our developer experience team, or sometimes by guest speakers, like today. We are very lucky to have Brett Fisher, who's a Docker captain, and um, we'll be talking about sort of Kubernetes or Swarm. I uh, still sort of think about like what are the best orchestrators that you might need for your use cases. So we're very, very lucky to have um, uh, Brett here and we'll be covering a lot of topics. So hopefully you'll have lots of questions. So before we get started, uh, as I mentioned, I work for a company called Weaveworks, as well as Stacy. We are part of the developer experience team. If you've never heard of, heard, heard of us before, we're a startup based in uh, now five offices. We have San Francisco, London, New York, Berlin, Colorado, as well as distributed teams. Uh, if you've heard of the technology RabbitMQ, our CEO and CTO uh, are the people who created the technology and the company around it. Uh, and then they sold it to VMware, moved into Pivotal, and then started seeing needs in the container space, and then led to um, some open source projects that then led to the company Weaveworks. Uh, we're a VC funded company, uh, mostly by Excel Partners and others. Uh, one of them is also Google Ventures. Uh, so I'll mention them because that sort of shows our you know, uh, part in the container and Kubernetes spaces. A lot of what we've done is in the open source. So hopefully you've heard of some of the things we've done. The longest project we've had is called WeaveNet and it is still today like one of the most premier projects that you would use for networking your Kubernetes clusters. Uh, we also have Cortex, which has been in the CNCF for a while now. It is built upon Prometheus and helps scale and uh, expand your abilities for Prometheus. Uh, we also have Flux that recently joined the CNCF as a sandbox project. Um, and that does automated deployments that sort of led to what you may have heard of as GitOps. That's a term that our CEO coined here and kind of is um, becoming the, the term around the Kubernetes space. Uh, and there's got plenty more that we haven't listed here. Um, I'll do a quick mention of Weave Flagger, which is one of our most recent projects. And that builds upon this concept of GitOps uh, and then brings like things like uh, Canary deployments, Blue Green, AB, these sort of terms that now have started to come under the umbrella term of progressive delivery. And so Flagger allows you to do that um, first, leveraging some service methods, but now like actually you can do it even without. Uh, so those are some of the things we've been working on. Uh, we are also a company that has some paid products. So our longest product has been Weave Cloud, and it is a SaaS product that helps you do Kubernetes management, monitoring, and automated deployments. And so in some ways, it's a hosted version of some of these open source projects that I mentioned that puts a UI in front of it and then does deep integration. So for example, if you want to do GitOps, you would, you would set parameters uh, using Prometheus metrics. Uh, for example, you'd also do that with um, what I mentioned, like Canary and Blue Green deployments. You can do that. Um, within our product and set parameters for Prometheus metrics so that you are not manually um, change, you know, changing the course of your traffic. Uh, so we've been running that production for four years now. And so that means we also have Kubernetes um, uh, experience in production because we run Weave Cloud on Kubernetes on AWS. Uh, and so as we were kind of going through this journey and our customers were going through this journey, we realized that a lot of people actually wanted help with um, the expertise that we had and help with their journey. So we are currently in the process of productizing the Kubernetes layer that we created for Weave Cloud and we're calling it Weave Kubernetes Platform. And of course we are making it a GitOps aware enterprise platform uh, for those needs. Um, and since we do have experience, we do offer some consulting training and support as part of using those products. So if this is helpful for you and you're interested, if this is your first time, thanks for joining us. Our website is weave.works. Uh, check us out and if you have any questions we'll be sending up a follow-up email so you can definitely follow up with me or uh, meet us in our Slack channel for anything related to these products. So thanks for listening. Uh, we'll get to a little bit of housekeeping. As I mentioned, uh, we're lucky to have Brett Fisher here who um, is a Docker captain and 
very appropriately, we'll be talking about Kubernetes Swarm and what orchestrator um, you might need for your needs. As I mentioned, uh, my name is Tomo Nakahara. I head the developer experience team where we have a bunch of fantastic community managers and developer advocates or developer experience engineers who do all kinds of um, open source contributions and project management in the Kubernetes space. Uh, if you haven't been here before, our general duration is we kind of keep it loose between 30 and 45 minutes. These usually hover at around 45 minutes after the talk and the Q&A. Uh, we will go as long as 60 minutes if there's like tons of burning questions, but we have an absolute hard stop at 60 minutes. But these generally have around 45 minutes. We're using a platform called Zoom. So the best way to ask questions and answer each other's questions is through the chat box. Hopefully you can find that button. If not, sometimes hitting escape gets you out of full screen mode and you can see the Zoom uh, dashboard, the capabilities a little bit better. And a, a reminder that when you do chat, please make sure that you set chat to everyone uh, so that other people can see your questions um, or even your responses because some people help each other. So uh, with that, I will hand it over to Brett. Let me know if you can take over or if you need me to stop sharing. Thank you. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'm ready to share when you're ready to share. Okay, you're I'll ready to let sharing. me share. Yes. So thanks for coming, everyone. Um, my name is Brett, and I talk about containers on the internet and in real life and to a lot of people, and I help people uh, implement them. I've done that for quite a while now. So I thought today I would talk about multiple orchestrators because that's not a popular thing to talk about right now, and I thought, let's talk about it. Um, it's, it was a topic that is a part of a lot of my workshops and, in fact, comes up every week on my YouTube Live just about. And then in my courses where all my students are talking about different orchestrators, it's a popular topic. So I thought we'd talk about it and stuff like that. Let me uh, share some slides here. So uh, real quick, if you don't recognize me and haven't heard of my stuff, I, I put stuff on the internet at brettfisher.com slash docker. That's all my Docker, Kubernetes, and Swarm resources, everything containers that I get involved with as a Docker captain and community leader. And then um, brettfisher.com slash YouTube will take you over to my YouTube channel where, similar to this little chit chat, I am live every week with guests. In fact, just last week, WeaveWorks was on the show. So if you go to that link, we talk for almost, like, almost an hour about GitOps and what that really means and we've worked products that relate to that on the Kubernetes side of things. So it's really, it was a fun chat and it was cool to talk about all that stuff with the team. So go check that out. That's, uh, that's on that YouTube link. And then of course I'm on Twitter if you wanna ask questions or talk about DevOps and container stuff there. All right, so first rule here is you can ask questions anytime and in the chat and I'll, we can talk about anything. This is really me sort of giving my opinion and what I see in the marketplace and what's going on there. And, you know, it's something that's a lot of opinions. So I understand that people have their, people are like one thing over another and I'm the same way. We all like the tools that solve the problems for us the most. So I'm interested in your, your, your opinions, your questions, like stuff like that. So let's do this. Uh, this was actually part of a talk I did in a workshop in Berlin last month at GoTo Berlin. And we had a room full of people there, both learning Swarm and Kubernetes in the same day. So it was interesting to take them from zero container orchestration uh, or people that were there that had experience with one of the two, and then to translate that knowledge from one orchestrator to the other, compare and contrast, talk about the pros and cons of each. And so that's what we did all day. And I thought I'd cram that into you know, 15 minutes of talking about it here. So the problem here is that if this is common in the entire IT industry. There's no, never just one tool, right? There's not just one cloud. There's never just one solution to a problem. And there's often a winner or a majority of users in a particular tool to solve the problem, but it doesn't mean that all the other tools go away, right? And so if you look back at the history of container orchestration, which I didn't put in these slides, you know, we've had lots of orchestrators and containers. We've had lots of work orchestrators before containers were around. And there's no reason to think that we're done. And just because Kubernetes is currently, depending on who you talk to, somewhere between 
60 and 80% of the deployments, uh, depending on where you're at and what part of the community you're in, uh, that doesn't mean that it's going to be the last one, right? That we won't have something else beyond that. So I think it's always helpful to know multiple tools because there's a saying around, if you, if you only have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And a lot of that has to do with, if we know one way of doing something, if we want, know one solution to a problem, every problem like that, we only have one way of fixing it. So I started out with uh, Swarm Classic, if you guys remember that, way long ago, 2015, I think was that time frame, and uh, Kubernetes and Swarm Classic, and then Swarm Mode came out in 2016. And I've been a fan of all that stuff. I've run stuff in production on ECS as well, and AWS for clients. And I know people today that still use AWS ECS as a solid orchestrator, and that is Amazon's custom-owned solution, right? So there's obviously lots of choices out there, even though Kubernetes gets a majority of the limelight on the internet. So I feel like it's our responsibility, if you're specifically in a DevOps space or the sysadmin space, and it's your job to manage this stuff, then you should probably know more than one tool, all right? So in, to summarize and compare and contrast the two, let's start with Swarm real quick, if, just in case you're not up to date on what Swarm mode is. It's a, a feature inside of Docker Engine, which means if you have Docker installed anywhere, you have the option of Swarm mode, as long as it's within uh, let's see, 2016 or newer version of Docker Engine. So I hope you, you have that newer versions, um, which means it runs everywhere Docker runs, right? It runs on mainframes, it runs on IoT devices, embedded devices. It, it runs in a lot of places and it's very minimal use. It doesn't actually spin up anything new. It's all just a part of the Docker daemon engine. So it's not running a bunch of extra services. So the nice thing there is it's very memory and CPU efficient, even in relatively large clusters. It's um, meaning, you know, 30 nodes or something like that. You can get a lot of stuff out of pretty small instances there. And it, the thing is, though, is it's mostly maintained by Docker Inc. with limited third-party support, which includes a WeaveNet, by the way. So WeaveNet actually is a networking plugin for Docker and Swarm. And uh, Weave has been one of those companies that they, um, Weaveworks has supported a lot of the different parts of the tooling over the years. So they were early with Kubernetes. They were early with Swarm and the Docker plugins for networking. So it's been pretty cool to play with those tools over the years. Um, so this is the interesting part about Swarm is that even though it's open source, it never really caught on in the third party community. I, my opinion on that is that because it was so easy, it didn't need a lot of third party support, um, but that's just, that's just me. So it tends to be used by what I'll call solo DevOps. So if you're someone in your company where your job is to spin up these servers and maybe this in the cloud, maybe this in your data center, then if you're a single person, it's gonna be pretty tough for you to deploy Kubernetes because it's a lot of stuff in Kubernetes. So a lot of people there, especially if they're new to Kubernetes, they might gravitate to Swarm because it's so much simpler. It has a reduced feature set, but it's easier to set up, it's easier to manage, it's secure by default out of the box, that kind of stuff. So when I'm in a room at a conference and I'm talking to a room full of people, probably around, 25 to 30% of the people there will raise their hand and say they're the solo DevOps person. And they tend to go for easier solutions, right? They might use cloud-hosted Kubernetes, or they might deploy a, deploy a Swarm, or they might have both. And that tends to be the market for Swarm, is that the, the, the teams that have three or less DevOps full-time people. Um, but it's also used by very big companies. So Docker puts out statistics on you know, who their customers are, and they talk about that you know, a lot of these larger companies still use Swarm and often use both depending on their need because they don't use just one tool. And the, the idea there is that um, it's streamlined for developers. So if you, if you think of the Docker CLI, the Docker CLI is, there's a lot of tooling in that one CLI and that's largely because it's designed for developers. If you ever meet a Linux admin um, like myself, we tend to like tools that are small and isolated and do one thing well. Um, that's sort of the Linux way and the Unix way. And Docker is not that, right? Docker Engine has a ton of stuff in it. So it, it tends to be streamlined for people that it's not their full-time job to manage every little piece of a server, right? And know a 
you know, 100 different command line utilities in Linux. So it was streamlined with that idea that if you're using Docker locally, you're using Docker Compose locally, let's make that as streamlined for production as possible. The reality is now Docker has enough features that it actually will work with you know, any Kubernetes distribution from the Docker command line, um, as well as Swarm, even using the Compose file. So you could deploy to Swarm or Kubernetes clusters just using Docker stack deploy. And um, I'm not gonna talk about that today, but that's part of the continuing feature growth of those toolings, right? So if we look at the Kubernetes on the other side of it, right, it's a series of containers that run on top of Docker, usually, runs on top of Docker. Um, and it's designed, it was designed by enterprise operators for enterprise operators. And that's a good thing for me, because that's kind of what my, my background is. Um, and the API and the high level abstracts there are designed for it to be layered on top by other tooling like Weaveworks, Kubernetes distributions, and other distributions of Kubernetes, because that's what it was sort of built for. It was built to be this low lying architecture of APIs with a single command line that was there for gurus to manage. That's the cube control command line. And then they, the, the original creators of the project were hoping that higher level abstractions would be built for wrapping around the Kubernetes vanilla upstream and that that would be how it's managed. So that's why you see today over, it's over 60. I'm not sure if we quite hit 80 distributions of Kubernetes. And so it's a lot like Linux distributions. We have this huge growth and uh, a lot of companies adding value on top of Kubernetes and putting their own spin on it, right? They're, they create their own GUIs. Maybe they integrate more with their tooling. Um, yeah, so that's, it's a quite a different uh, ecosystem than the Swarm one has created, right? So it does require more management, more resources, more people, more skills, more training, and not everyone has the ability to do that. But if you are, once you've kind of learned the Kubernetes way and you've learned the tooling, then it's no big deal, right? Like it's like any tool. Once you've learned it and you know it well, um, you tend to, and you like it, you tend to want to use it. So that's why we start to see all these cloud vendors that have all adopted Kubernetes is also because they can add value there. They can, you know, one of the harder parts of Kubernetes is deploying it. So everyone's got their own deployment tooling and that makes it easier for you to deploy and manage and upgrade Kubernetes, which is not so easy to do in a high availability situation. Um, but it also comes, that means it comes out of the box with so many more things, right? It has more features, more workflows. It doesn't come as opinionated as Swarm. So you can create your own workflows and opinions about how you want to manage your infrastructure with it. Swarm, on the other hand, has you know much smaller command set and is really focused on a, a streamlined developer pushing apps with Docker tooling onto clusters, whether that's Swarm clusters or Kubernetes. But Swarm, I tend to consider Swarm more opinionated. And what that really means is that uh, it's it's taking Docker's idea of how orchestration should run and applying it directly rather than just providing you a set of resources, which is what Kubernetes does. It provides you dozens and dozens of resources and says, pick whichever ones you like, use them however you like. And then people are layering these, or these orchestrator GUIs and distributions on top of that to provide their opinion of how to use Kubernetes actually. So when you use one distribution's Kubernetes, you might have different features and that's largely based on their opinion of how you should use it. So it's kind of interesting. You get to uh, either choose your path or have the path provided to you. Um, so different strokes for different folks there. The, um, the advantage of Kubernetes is it, it has won the internet. So you're gonna find so many more resources on learning and training and tooling. And at times we were victims to the fact that there's just so much out there there's actually over 80 tools right now to deploy apps on Kubernetes, like Helm, right? You probably heard of Helm. So there's 80, 80 of those, 80 projects of that. And I think the number's a little less now because some of the projects have kind of just fallen off and aren't really supported anymore. But there's lots of opinions on how to deploy apps on Kubernetes. And that is both great because we get a lot of experimentation, but we're gonna need to wait a while before we really, you know, we really get down to maybe the, most popular five or something like that. Kubernetes for Helm, uh, Helm is definitely the number one, I think in terms of usage, uh, at least in GitHub stars, but there's lots of other ones that are growing and um, 
I wouldn't I wouldn't discount any of the other options for deploying applications on top of Kubernetes. Well, now, if you go to Swarm, Swarm really just kind of has one way. There's not a lot of tooling or experimentation. It's pretty much just what Docker provides you. And there's some third-party open source projects, but they're not near as popular as the stuff on the Kubernetes side. So, and, and every vendor is Kubernetes first, right? So if you're in a large enterprise and you have lots of vendors, um, you probably already have a vendor contract that has a Kubernetes distribution. <laughs> so uh, most companies in the tech space have adopted some form of, we do Kubernetes for whatever their thing is, whether it's storage or networking or you know, management or monitoring or whatever it is. And that's, that's an advantage because the chances are if you adopt Kubernetes, all of your other tooling probably has some sort of solution for it. Um, whereas on the, on the Swarm side, the options there are much smaller. I, usually what, for whatever solution there is, there might be three or four um, different tools that do that, right? And you have a lot less choice. But for people getting started, that tends to actually resonate better with them. They don't, they're not so overwhelmed with all the choices. So um, the reason, so I tend to teach Swarm first. Uh, in fact, when I do my workshops, I'll, um, if, they're, if you're taking my courses, you go from Docker to Swarm to Kubernetes because Swarm's concepts translate over to Kubernetes so well. Uh, obviously, they're different command lines, but you understand the basics of container orchestration before you jump into the Kubernetes world. And I think that I get a lot of feedback that that's, that's helpful. It also helps them learn both of them at the same time. So. Uh, but things that they both can do, like this is just kind of a short list of things they all can do. Uh, they both both run Linux and Windows now. For a while, Swarm was the only one that had stable Windows support. So it was definitely early on the Windows side. So if you're a Windows shop, it's much more popular to run Swarm than it is Kubernetes right now. Kubernetes just this year went GA with Windows support on Windows Server 2019. And uh, so that's catching up quickly, right, on the Kubernetes side. They both can scale. Although I think at this point, uh, the official numbers on Kubernetes are a little larger, but at this point we're talking about many thousands of nodes, right? And then there's, there's not that many people that need thousands of nodes. So you're, you're pretty rare if you need to be that big. Um, they both have open source paid versions. They both are well-documented and have been in production for a while by large company. So there's a lot of similarity there. And then of course, there's a lot of differences. But when we get into the what I would call the very opinionated part of this conversation <laughs> uh, is that sometimes decisions around tooling aren't made around features by engineers. And we've all been there. Someone in management just says, you're gonna do this thing. And you didn't get a choice, you didn't get a say, you just were told, we're gonna implement a tool. This has happened throughout the years, you know, back in the day it was IBM, back in the you know, 80s and 90s. Uh, there was a time where it was, and it probably still is, if you're gonna do virtualization, VMware is the default assumption. So if you wanna to try to do something other than VMware, it might be an uphill battle with your management. And now, you know, in clouds, that might be Amazon, and just depending on where you are in the ecosystem. And then with orchestrators, it's definitely Kubernetes, right? Uh, executives have read the internet and believe that they need to have Kubernetes, even if they don't know what it does. And so when I, when I do surveys, and I do surveys all the time in, my, in the rooms when I'm, talking at workshops and at conferences uh, throughout the year, I always ask the room like, you know, how many of you are using this, how many are using that? And then I sort of get people to yell out, you know, why are you using Kubernetes or how did you decide Kubernetes? Obviously I can't do that in a large room, but in a small room, I can ask them individually and almost always the answer is, uh, I was told to run Kubernetes. <laughs> so, it's a very popular checkoff. It can actually be a political checkoff list for executives. So in that case, you don't actually have a choice. You have to run the tool because they told you to. Um, so yeah, there's, there's other reasons beyond technical and sometimes that's okay, sometimes it's not. It's just a part of life. And um, that's what I was saying earlier that you know, Docker, then Swarm, then Kubernetes. That's how I, I learned it, that's how I teach it. Um, if you know that your organization is only gonna use Kubernetes and then sure, don't necessarily make Swarm a priority, but maybe someday go learn ECS or learn Swarm or something else beyond Kubernetes so that you have a, a comparison in your own mind. So I have talked specifically to companies that I work with, uh, people at conferences that have moved from one orchestrator to the other for various reasons. Um, there's a talk at DockerCon from a, um, a company that 
they're an insurance company, a large insurance company, and they started out with Swarm years ago. Then they moved to Kubernetes because they believed that that was basically what everyone was telling them to do. And then they went back out of Kubernetes, went back to Swarm. And what's fun about it is they did, they did talks at DockerCon. And they, so if you go back like two years, you can hear the talk about going from Swarm to Kubernetes. And then the next year there was going from Swarm to Kubernetes and back again. So they actually talked over the years and you got to hear the, the same, same two people talk about their experiences and just that they realized that once they got to Kubernetes that they didn't actually need all that complexity. So, they, um, so it was an interesting story because we don't hear a lot of those. Not a ton of people are doing that. Most people are choosing Kubernetes. So it's nice to hear some of the other chatter in the ecosystem beyond just what the blogs and the news outlets are putting out there, right? And the reality is at the end of the day that there is no one, one size fits all, which is why I think just like with anything uh, in, in tech, it's good to know multiple options so that you have one. I'm an engineer that tries not to be biased, but I do have my favorite tools. I like Kubernetes for some things. I really like Swarm for other things. So it just depends on the project and the client I'm working with. And we evaluate their needs, the, you know, their budget, the number of engineers they have, any other requirements, and we figure out which thing they're going to use. Some of them end up doing something like ECS on AWS because they're all in on AWS and they don't really have an opinion about which orchestrator. They just want to solve a problem. So, all right. So this is the sort of the, one of the last right. slides here is... Is it good uh, to... Oh. Jump in with a question? Or yeah, do it. Um, so someone was asking, does Swarm support alternate runtimes like uh, Creo or Podman? I actually don't know what the first one yeah. is. Cri-O? Yeah, cry I think, I think I just call it Cryo, but you know, it's the internet, so it's made up words. <laughs> but Creo, Cryo. The, uh, OK, so Swarm, technically, yes, but no one has done it. Um, it, it's, since it's built into Docker, obviously out of the box, it runs on Docker Engine. But if you go to the SwarmKit repo, they, they have a standalone version. You can build it yourself. Um, it has a little utility that, so you wouldn't be using the Docker command line and it has a little utility to manage it. But I, that's there to me just for their testing. I don't believe, I don't see anybody using that in the wild because to be honest, everyone I talk to that's deploying containers, they're just using the default or, uh, engine that comes with their, their distribution. So for example, on the Kubernetes side, technically there's three supported runtimes, but everyone just uses whatever came with their distribution. So if you're on Red Hats, you're gonna be running Cryo. If you're on you know, Docker Enterprise, you're gonna be running Docker engine underneath. And I don't see a lot of teams, um, we'll get to this in a minute, but I don't see a lot of teams making that choice about engine runtimes based on need for runtimes because at the end of the day they all do exactly the same thing um, they're just it's just a question of you you know you want to save I don't know 20 or 30 40 mega RAM or something like that depending on which one you use um, so it's a hot topic I think on reddit and on on Stack Overflow or on Y Combinator Hacker News but I, I don't see I don't have I've never seen actually a company or a client or a student customizing their runtime choice um, based on, so the, the, the reality there with Swarm, it's an interesting conversation. Uh, so thank you for the question. Uh, on the Docker side, if you think about the, the market for Swarm is that everyone is, that's doing Swarm is looking for an easy button, really. I mean, the people that I talked to and their motivations for using Swarm is that they just want to get the work done so they can move on to the next project. And so the easy button for that is installing Docker because it's, it's a one line, you know, install if you're using their automation script or it's, you know, going to their website and filling in five or six lines. So that, um, that tends to be their motivation. So I think the last thing they're probably looking to do is um, customize that and, and tweak it in some way to avoid using the Docker engine. But it's an, it's an interesting conversation. I just don't see anybody doing it. It's also yeah. something that has uh, effects on how these on the, the actual users and the effect of the open source community. So if you look at like the SwarmKit repo versus the people that are in the Kubernetes repos in terms of like GitHub issues and is, you know, Kubernetes really got its start with a lot of large companies doing very large things that had full teams of people doing all this stuff where Swarm was used by individuals and very small teams that weren't, even, that weren't professional operators that were just trying to get orchestration working. And so what that ends up meaning is that the issue, when I look at both, and they're quite different because the, 
the people that are in swarm conversations tend to be users that are just trying to get work done. And so they're not contributing back as many PRs. They're, they're not, they're not even go programmers. So they wouldn't know how to do that. You know, they're um, maybe they're the only person in their company that's doing both operations and development, or they're in a, a you know, a company with only 10 or less engineers. Um, and whereas Kubernetes, it, very early gathered so many large teams that those two people are what really made Kubernetes successful by extending it, adding more functionality to it, providing a lot of PRs. Mm -hmm. So um, at least that's my take on it. Yes. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, we do a few. Um, so kind of going back to your previous slide, it's a little bit metaphorical, but the person was asking like, what are the, the cliff edges or like, you know, um, the, I guess sort of the, the areas where they, with your use cases where you, definitely decide on one or the other because of the risks involved. I guess that's yeah. how I interpret that question. Yeah, the, maybe the, yeah, the rough edges. Well, um, I would say that people that are not willing to put in all the time and investment to learn Kubernetes, and maybe they're on their own or there's only two of them that are going to be responsible for it, mm -hmm. I tend to find them... I see more people there sort of walking away and just sort of throwing up their hands a little bit because they, they're they a little bit overwhelmed might be the wrong word, but they don't have the time it, it needs. They need to invest in that product because at each level of Kubernetes, depending on distribution, you have to make a lot of decisions about authentication, networking, you know, which networking provider you're going to use, um, storage providers and ingress provider, you know, it goes on and on and on. So it, gets a little tricky there with swarm the less you have less choice so if you're someone who likes flexibility and doesn't want to be sort of put into a corner with the this is like the one or two solutions you have for that uh swarm is not going to go well for you because it is that that scenario where you know there's only a couple of major open source uh tools for providing off server storage right or if you want a GUI on top of Swarm, there's, you know, in terms of open source, there's really two major ones and there's only one paid one, right? And so a lot of people, they like that simplicity. Maybe they want a single vendor and they're okay with Docker as their vendor and they go that route or they're, they want, you know, they're, they're in an enterprise and they have all these other requirements like we have to integrate with these different tools and they're all on the compatibility list for, you know, Kubernetes, your choice might end up, might, might be made there. Right. Um, I'm trying to think of what else. I think over time, what we're seeing is there's like this. Uh, so there's this range. If I had a graph, like there's the super easy button, which was Swarm on day one, and then there was, you know, three years ago, four years ago, Kubernetes was much more complicated than it is now because it's and and they're moving toward the center. So Kubernetes is on this side is getting easier to use. Like we have kubeadmin now for deploying it if you want to do vanilla deployments if you don't want to choose a distribution. So that makes it easier to get it right because it was often difficult and often led to insecure deployments of Kubernetes. And so that would make, that stuff is all making Kubernetes easier. We also see new command lines and the command lines in Kubernetes are changing to become easier for new people. And so it's definitely working its way towards being more mainstream acceptable. And then Swarm is slowly adding new features. This year they announced they were, they were working on jobs, cron job support, and then more storage options for them. And we'll see where that takes them. So, yeah. So um, we have quite a few questions, but I was thinking maybe we'll leave them to the end because we want to make sure you get through your deck. And you mentioned EC2. One of the first questions actually that came up before you started was a question about how you might do this with Fargate. So we'll book, we'll bookmark all of these and okay. um, we'll try to get to them to the end. So thanks yeah, for all your um, questions. Yeah, and I've only have a few more here. Um, so uh, the, the, the deeper we get in this deck, the more it's going to be Brett, Brett's opinion. <laughs> so uh, the, the VHS first Betamax, when you live in, in this bubble, and the bubble of containers is definitely a bubble, right? When you, you live every day in this for years and years, and uh, you go to, you're going to the conferences and you're talking about it and nonstop, it, it definitely becomes a bubble where you start to feel like everybody's doing orchestration and everybody's doing Kubernetes. And that, and that skews the results. So every once in a while, I'll go to a, an industry conference that's not strictly, you know, uh, Linux foundation, like cloud deployment kind of stuff. And it's maybe more traditional developers that are maybe more, um, you know, in the U.S. it would be government and military. 
developers and they don't they don't live in that bubble and it's very interesting to realize that a lot of our assumptions might actually only be a part of the little community of of container ecosystem that we live in so these are a couple of slides i put together to say you know don't always believe what you read on the internet like just about once a week someone on uh reddit says swarm or kubernetes uh <laughs> or someone says why does everybody tell me to not use swarm i think was the last one i saw this week on reddit and you'll get great opinions on both sides some people will say well you know the storage vendors i use don't work in swarm that well so you know or you know we're we have to deploy across this many things and we needed uh, a, a tool that has that manages many different clusters called and that's called federation where you can manage multiple clusters with one tool and swarm doesn't swarm has that with one open source tool but um maybe maybe they don't want to use that tool it's like the, the official tools don't support it so there's varying degrees of opinions on it right so when i try to sum this up i'm like okay well look at it from maybe a few decisions you can make here is if you really need windows server support maybe and you don't have a lot of other requirements that would lead you down a kubernetes path maybe you would choose swarm that way maybe that would be a, a helpful decision is that swarm has had kubernetes uh sorry windows server support much longer the docker team has worked very closely with the microsoft team and now that same team is working with the kubernetes team and they're all working together on getting kubernetes up to you know feature parity with swarm and um stuff like that so that might be one thing uh, if you're someone who's not wanting to do this stuff full time, since the Kubernetes world tends to change very fast right now, it's getting a little slower. We saw this year in 2019, we saw two releases that were more focused on stability and patching and less a whole bunch of new features kind of deployments. So, um, or updates rather. So, so that's a challenge because some people, they just don't have the time to rapidly update this stuff all the time. And so that might be a thing where Swarm is a little more, they only release twice a year. It's pretty minimal in terms of changes. They really focus on backwards compatibility where Kubernetes is maybe, um, they're, they're basically leading edge. They're, they're figuring out all this stuff as they go. And so they're, you know, different commands are changing over time. Certain things work in your YAML files and then now they don't. Um, anyway, so that's, that's one decision factor. But one of the things I want to do is also back up a second and say, let's look at the creators of these tools, like the big thinkers, because I'm not really a big thinker. Like I'm not those kind of smart people. So if you look back and you remember that the Kubernetes designers designed it for enterprise ops. So if you're strictly a developer and you're looking for an easy button tool, I would say the only way you should be using Kubernetes is to get uh, like a cloud version um, that manages it for you so that you don't have to manage the servers, the deployments, the upgrades of those servers themselves. Because that is a, a significant amount of work in Kubernetes that you may not want to do, right? And then um, the Swarm maintainers goal, they came from a different approach. They wanted to take basically the 80-20, the 20% of features from Kubernetes or just from all orchestrators that met 80% of the need, and then they stuck with that. So a lot of the requests on the Swarm, if you read on GitHub, people would request this feature from Kubernetes now work in Swarm. And the Swarm maintainers are more like, well, we don't get a lot of requests for that and a lot of people use that. So we're not gonna just build it because a few people want it. It really would have to be the majority of people. So it, the challenge there is that you don't always get every feature you want out of the box, right? So the Docker, uh, one of the Docker founders, um, in a conversation once predicted that eventually all these orchestrators are really going to look alike. It's just a question of how they get there, right? They're all going to end up being much easier and have a lot more features. So uh, it's an interesting concept, but the founder of Rancher made a new project called K3S, which he said at DockerCon this year that he, he loved Swarm for its simplicity of deployment and management, but he wanted to use Kubernetes. So he made K3S and I think it uses only like, um, it's like 50 mega or five, less than 500 meg uh, requirements for the server in terms of memory, which is um, you would need more than that for a normal Kubernetes deployment. And so he, they take it, they take all the Kubernetes stuff and they combine it into one little binary so that it's actually achievable to run it on things like Raspberry Pis and stuff. And he joked about uh, K, Kubernetes was too hard, so he made K3S. And he, he created the project as a joke, but now it's becoming this major uh, GitHub repo with all these people talking about it because I think a lot of people really want to use Kubernetes, but it's just too much work and too much complexity. So the thing that K3S is doing now is it's making it easier for deployment in terms of the nodes and the infrastructure, 
it doesn't necessarily make it any easier to deploy your apps. It just makes the management of the infrastructure easier. So we'll see, that's kind of a new thing. We'll see if that's a trend uh, in terms of these uh, different distributions, making it you know, push button easy to deploy and manage it. And then the last part here is, we all have to be aware that there are echo chambers in these bubbles that we live in. And so what I do is I like to look at surveys of usage and the sort of key numbers are, is this project's usage growing? Are more people installing it or are less people using it than last time, right? So if we see any open source project or any tool uh, over time you know, decreasing in usage, then that's probably an indicator to not use it, right? To not jump on that tool right now because once a tool starts to languish in popularity in terms of actually declining usage, it's probably on its way out. Like, you know, there's not a whole lot of open source tools that tend to recover from that part of the curve. And what I keep saying, and I haven't seen any uh, lately, these are all the ones that I've seen are all the way through 2018. The 2019 ones are, um, I don't have a judgment on yet. But all the ones in 2018 were showing both Kubernetes and Swarm growing in usage. Now, Kubernetes was exponentially growing more, but more people were still adopting Swarm than the year before. So that's, to me, like once that stops happening, if that were to stop happening on a tool, I wouldn't want to recommend it because I feel like people are clearly not adopting it and, and are leaving it, in fact. And that's just not happening with these tools yet because I, um, what we're seeing in even places like India, uh, just learning and adopting Docker is still on the incline, right? Um, it's all across all of these different markets, especially in other parts of the world outside of North America, these tools are, are rapidly getting adopted more. So we're going to still see more and more growth in before we even approach any sort of peak container tooling. And I think we're going to, you know, that's going to affect how these projects handle, right? The other thing here is just remember and realize that there's marketing involved, right? This is, these are all tools that are either open source or paid tools, but somebody's probably making money by supporting them or releasing vendor products. So one of the things I want to point out to people is that as a sort of a pitch for put a filter on when you're hearing the marketing, when you're reading the blogs, when you're talking, when you're seeing the stuff on the internet, realize that there, there's actually no one at Docker that I know of that's paid to, to promote Docker to Swarm because they support both Swarm and Kubernetes. So they kind of just talk about both equally. And there's a ton of people throughout the industry that are paid to promote Kubernetes. And that's not a bad thing. We, we, that helps us understand the tooling and it helps us learn it. But it does mean that the, the churn cycle of news and blog posts and all that stuff is through paid promotion, right? A lot of that is uh, stuff from companies that want you to adopt their CI CD tool or whatever because they now support Kubernetes. So the challenge there is as practitioners, we have to put that, that filter on our head and realize okay, just because 90% of the people in this one place are all talking about Kubernetes or whatever, doesn't necessarily mean that 90% of people in production are using Kubernetes. And so that's why I like to go to the usage surveys as a real indicator for what's being used and what's not. And then lastly there, um, if you're considering conferences, uh, KubeCon, obviously KubeCon is next week uh, in uh, San Diego, I believe. And it's much more ops focused. So it's very focused on the Kubernetes ecosystem and ops focused. So obviously everyone there is a big Kubernetes fan and um, learning to adopt it or use it or, or build something for it. At DockerCon, the interesting comparison there is that you have people there for, that like Swarm, you have people there that like Kubernetes, and uh, it's smaller now. It used to be the largest uh, container conference, but it's much smaller now than uh, KubeCon because KubeCon's grown so quickly. Um, and it's much more dev-focused at, dev at DockerCon. So if you're a developer, it's a conference that uh, tends to be a little more balanced and a lot of the sessions, mine included, are more focused on, focused on people that don't necessarily uh, live full time in the ops world um, like you might, ha might have more often at KubeCon. So that's it for my slides. Let's, um, let's answer some questions. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, let's get through these many questions that we had. Uh, I mentioned that at the beginning we had someone asking about Fargate. Um, are there, um, yeah, they're just asking, you know, do you have opinions about Fargate and within this context? Yeah, I mean, Far Fargate is great when you don't have the people to manage the servers, right? And that's what we're seeing is all of these different cloud providers, 
um, and all these different distributions of Kubernetes are trying to make it easy enough that people don't say no to Kubernetes, right? Uh, Fargate is designed for teams that need more management, right, than what uh, someone, someone else normally would. In fact, now we're seeing things like Google Cloud. They have uh, Google Cloud Run, which essentially allows you to just deploy a container. <laughs> uh, it's almost like Heroku. It's so easy. And uh, we're, I think that we are sort of past the peak of all these whiz-bang features and the orchestration in the container world, and now we're largely focused on adoption and ease of use, which is really good for us because we're going to be the beneficiaries of all that. And so hopefully um, Fargate will get a little cheaper. And I know some people don't choose it because it's more expensive, but um, I think that in the long term, not a lot of us have good reasons to manage our own clusters. And uh, we're going to, you know, probably push that out to the experts. Just like I always talk about, if you're going to do databases and containers, if you're on a cloud that already provides that as a service, just do that. Like, just because we have container databases doesn't mean you should do that. You should probably yeah. use whatever the provider's tool is because they're probably better at it running it than you are. So they're probably better at backing it up, monitoring it, providing redundancy. And so that's, that, that's a common conversation in my workshops is people love orchestration, they want to put everything in it, and then they have a real challenge with databases, not because it's bad for, for containers, but just because databases are hard, and it's hard to get it right, and it's hard to move that database engine around a bunch of servers and let its data move with it at the same time. And so uh, people want to do that, but then they end up spin, up spin up a whole bunch of effort and time and servers, and then they don't really have much to show for it because they could have just used the cloud hosting version. <laughs> so. yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so our next question is a quote from Container Journal, and this person is asking, do you believe that this statement is true? Huh? <laughs> Quite a long statement. So the statement is, Kubernetes specifies that each pod should be able to freely communicate with every other pod in the cluster in a given namespace, whereas Docker has a concept of creating virtual network topologies, and you have to specify which ne networks you want for your containers to connect to. The former is meant to run across a cluster while the latter runs on a single node. So this person's asking, do you agree with this quote? Does this jive with your experience? Um, kinda, I'm trying to, so uh, maybe it'll help if I describe the networking differences. So with Docker Swarm, uh, basically the default out of the box driver is called overlay. You can also do something like WeaveNet but both of these provide a overlay functionality. That means that all the nodes in a swarm talk across that stack. Okay, so um, without getting too much into it, you can create a bunch of Docker networks and then when, and if you need a um, container to talk on different networks to different other containers across all the servers, you just attach it to, to multiple networks. So it might, it might be on five networks, right? If it's like an API in the middle and it needs to talk to the database network. So Docker has that virtual network concept. Um, and there are other networking providers for Docker, but they all tend to do that same thing. You can actually do host mode networking and other things. But with Kubernetes, it's dealer's choice. So you start out of the box with all the pods being able to communicate with each other. That's a statement from the documentation, and I think that's maybe taken out of context because what that really means is, in, is that there shouldn't be a bunch of firewalls between nodes in um, Kubernetes. It doesn't expect a bunch of barriers or NAT between nodes. But when you choose your networking provider, and you have to make a choice because there is no default out of the box, um, that provider will give you the functionality. If you choose something like WeaveNet, it provides an overlay network very similar to what uh, Swarm has or Flannel. If you, provide, if you choose Calico, you get a whole different set of tooling. So it, it depends on the network tool on whether you do things like, is it going to NAT? Is it going to be real IPs on the network? You know, is, are there going to be network policies that protect the different machines from, see, or, sorry, different containers from seeing each other based on their networks? That's a question for your network provider in Kubernetes. So I would say that both can do that same thing of isolating containers into discrete groups on different uh, virtual networks, but Kubernetes can also do a lot more than that depending on your provider. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, the next question is, how much configuration effort is required to secure each? I guess this is kind of going back to 
um, configuring Kubernetes versus configuring Swarm. Right. Yeah. So a swarm, it's one, it's one line to create a swarm. It's one line to join a, a node to a swarm. Everything, is in, everything that needs to be encrypted is encrypted by default, including the database, the communications between nodes. If you want to encrypt your apps, you can choose that on a network by network basis. Um, so that one is nice and protected. There's no exposed ports that are unauthenticated out of the box. So swarm, there's no way to deploy swarm insecurely unless you deliberately open things up that weren't open up by default. With Kubernetes, that entirely depends upon your distribution. So you have to go to the distributions documentation. And the reason I'm not saying the vanilla upstream is because there's really not a good reason for like 99% of the people to do vanilla upstream. Because vanilla upstream means that you're downloading the open source projects, you're using something like kubeadmin, and those tools are a lot more work without really any benefit than all these distributions. You've got over 60 choices of distri distributions and the distributions make it their job to do things like provide installation, provide security and something uh, called role-based authentication, like uh, RBAC stuff. Um, so that's different per install. And we've seen some very large, um, on the Kubernetes side, we've seen large announcements that sort of say basically Kubernetes got hacked, like one famous one was Tesla. But the reason it got hacked was because someone put the web, web interface on top of Kubernetes, which isn't there by default, and they didn't password protect it. <laughs> so, so Bitcoin miners got in and took over the, the, the farm. That's not Kubernetes fault, but by and large, Kubernetes is much harder to, to configure securely. And so I always tell people to rely on the distribution and study that documentation. And if you're going to be, if you're in a company and you're going to deploy this as a company, you should talk to that vendor and talk to them about, you know, how they secure the API and all the different parts and pieces of that puzzle. So, yeah. Makes sense. Appreciate that. Um, I think you covered this a little bit, but we'll at least repeat the question. How difficult is it to specify virtual network Tophos in Swarm, for, uh, in Swarm, I guess. Sorry, read that again. How difficult is it to specify the virtual network topos? Topos. Is that an acronym? Um, Topology, maybe? Topology, sorry. Topology. Yeah, okay. It's, cut, it's coming off in the, in the chat. Um, the network topology. So I, I think that largely is based on the, I kind of answered that before. It's based on the networking driver. So both have networking driver options. Docker has a few, it has three or four out of the box, and then you can do things like WeaveNet, other network providers that are all on Docker's website. Kubernetes on their documentation have a list of at least eight or nine networking uh, plugins, and those largely, each one of those is quite different in how you implement it. And it, the nice thing on Kubernetes side is that I'd say it's more flexible, but it's also more complicated. So you have to know more, you have to spend more time with that. Whereas um, most people with Swarm, they kind of stick with the, the out-of-the-box overlay and they, they're fine with that. And I'd say less, far fewer people on Swarm side go to the custom, custom route, um, but they can, but yeah. yeah. Excellent. Well, we're getting toward the end. Uh, we have last two questions. Um, okay. Sorry, I want to make sure I didn't miss one. Uh, when do you need to move from Docker to an orchestration tool, whether it's Swarm or Kubernetes? So like, I guess, yeah. Ooh. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we didn't talk about that because not everyone needs orchestration. And orchestration really came out of the pain of deploying a lot of containers on a lot of servers. So, it, you know, if you're on a very small, if you have a, a lot of small needs, and you don't want to use something like Heroku or now the new Google Cloud Run or uh, something super simple on Amazon, um, then, and you, and you know you want to use, you want to sort of manage your own servers or maybe you want to even consider Kubernetes, um, I'd say that it's, it's all about what is your pain point because most of what Docker and the container ecosystem is about is about a, you know, we talk about DevOps and GitOps and all these things. And really what that's about is speed. In fact, when I do my Docker introduction talks for like executives and, and they, they look at this and they think, this is a whole lot of stuff and what do I get out of it? <laughs> so I talk to them about 
that this is really about speed, speed of deployment, speed of recovery, speed of, um, of automated recovery, of not just human recovery, but uh, basically being an agile environment. And we, we've spent you know, a decade on the agile manifesto trying to get the developers to adopt practices that would allow them to write code faster, test code faster, and provide it to ops. But then we didn't change ops. Like ops was still this thing we used to call it the IT cartel, that they would be in charge of the servers and wouldn't deploy it unless it was, you know, it took them a month to get something into production or whatever. And so containers came out of the way of what if we had a single deployable unit that we could then quickly push on a server with an HTTP connection and then the server would run it exactly the same way it ran it in test and in dev. Well, we started doing that. And then suddenly you ended up with a whole bunch of servers that you were having to manage each one individually. So that's where the idea of orchestration came from, was when you're too busy to manage all those servers and you need more time back, then that might be the time you consider uh, orchestration. Because the simplest definition of orchestration that I have is it takes a bunch of servers and makes them act like one. So if you're managing a bunch of servers and you're tired of individually controlling those or writing a bunch of Ansible you know, scripts and automation and, or a puppet or chef or whatever you have to try to deploy things to different places and update that one over there and then update that one over there. That's what orchestration is meant to do for you. As well as nowadays, it does so many other things like provides you monitoring and GUIs out of the box and automatic SSL and lots of other additional bonuses. But the real core issue was how much your time is spent managing deployments because that's what orchestration is meant to make easier. So if you're, yeah, that's your problem. Maybe orchestration is for you. Yes. Um, so unfortunately, we are out of time. Uh, we'll make sure Stacy uh, relays the final question over to you, and then you know, hopefully, we can get it in a chat somewhere or a, a good place. So thank you right. so much, Brett. Thanks for everybody for joining. I'm going to quickly share my closing slides. Um, and I appreciate your questions. And if anything comes up later, hopefully, you can see this. Um, we have future events. Uh, we've got other guest speakers coming up, um, but also um, we have our Slack channel. So if you have other questions that come up after this that you think about or that you know we couldn't get to yours, then please uh, do join us here and we can also um, relate to, to Brett to answer any other questions. So um, if this is your first time, like I said, thanks for coming. Um, our meetup group here is um, our best place to uh, get our information, sorry about that. Um, and if you're interested in the, the GitOps concept, um, we get, we'll send you this link for our GitOps ebook. So if you're interested in that, um, feel free to check the link and, and check it. So thank you again, Brett, and thanks to everybody for coming and for your questions. And I uh, hope we can do this again. This was really great. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thanks, thanks everyone. See you Bye. later. Bye.